Hey, hey everyone, back again. Today I want to talk about Hannah Arendt's idea of the social and what the social means for her. Now, if you're new here, uh, hi, I'm David. I try and explain ph philosophical texts and philosophical ideas in a pretty accessible way, at least I think. Um, but yeah, make sure to subscribe if you're new, because uh, I'd like to see you back again. Uh, and then before jumping into the social sphere, you can follow me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy if you want to see mostly pictures of my cats, that is. If you want to help me out, like, share, subscribe. If you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that with the links below. If you're listening to this in podcast form, you can find the video on YouTube. If you're listening to this on YouTube, you can find it in podcast form where there shouldn't be any ads, at least for now. Uh, I just don't know how to do how to do ads yet and I have no ad opportunities so it doesn't really matter uh, but yeah so let's talk about the social now I've done this whole book with a buddy of mine so you can go and listen to that whole thing if you'd like because that would you know be the best way to understand this but just to be somewhat brief I want to describe how Hannah Arendt characterizes a shift between a world in which there was a distinction between the public and the private realms and the world in which those two realms begin to fold into one another and form the social realm or form the social. So last week I talked about Habermas's idea of the public sphere, which of course implies a distinction from the private sphere, which would just be what people do in their homes. And this idea goes all the way back to Aristotle who is this talking about the necessity of there being a separate uh, mode of life, that is your private life, that is distinct from your public life in which you acted as a citizen to make you know, decisions on behalf of the general public, uh, which was you know, reserved for people with, with status, of course. But Habermas takes this idea and tries to extend it to the broader public, at least ostensibly. Now, Hannah Arendt really appreciates this dynamic. She appreciates a distinction between private and public life. And the reason for that is that you can't do things in public life that you can do in private life and vice versa. In fact, she sees it necessary for there to be a private life so that you can actually have time to think, which for her is really one of the most fundamental operations that make humans human. We can think. And that is something that is disallowed if you're just spending all your time talking. So to just riff on that briefly for a moment, this might be one way that Hannah Arendt would look with lamentation upon something like the internet, where we are always expected to have something to say. And we always have to say things. We never have that time to just sit back and, and think because it it takes time and you have to be in isolation and that's, that's not fun. So the shift occurs between a distinction from private, between private and public life into social life in relation to, in many ways, capital. Now, Arendt is critical of Marx, at least in her book, um, The Human Condition. She's quite critical of, of Marx in a, in a few different ways, and I don't, I don't wanna get into those here. But she acknowledges that in our economic practices, what we see is a transformation about how or in terms of how we engage with one another as subsistence beings. So in, in ways that we work out to fulfill our needs. And these methods are tethered to our kind of social setting, to, to the world in which we inhabit. So in our, you know, in some parts of the world, they will develop certain strategies, they would with these strategies develop certain tools that are specific to their settings. They would develop from that, you know, certain different ways of looking at the world that is specific to their setting and so on and so forth. Now with the move into a more capitalist economy, what we see is the kind of disintegration of these specific methods in favor of a more efficient, uh, you know, broader, productive, assembly line mode of uh, production. And with that comes the facilitation of consumption. Following production comes, you know, easier means of consumption. So we gradually lose attachment to our 
immediate setting and suddenly the world becomes open to us and we lose our attachment to individual objects as being you know sacred or anything in favor of you know things being immediately consumable or having very little chance of lasting a long time and you know being totally frivolous and just being for the moment now these all contribute to a change in the way that we engage not only with one another but with ourselves we are expected to be productive instead of expected to be you know um, sacred or expected to be thinking beings we are we are meant to be as productive as possible and with that comes the disintegration of a distinction between one's private life and one's public life because you are expected to be essentially productive in a very capitalistic sense in both and we can see this really play out especially today in the covid age where we rely so heavily on the internet and the distinction that we have between work and home life has blurred to to an extent that we've never seen before and with that comes you know new anxieties that i think hannah arendt would be very quick to say of course like of course you are always expected to be this kind of productive present being never to be on your own never to be just you know trusted to be doing your own thing you always have to be strapped into like some kind of chart or some kind of like spreadsheet you know in order to be uh properly recorded and documented by the bureaucratic machine to keep you in line to keep you functioning correctly so the social sphere is the sphere in which you're meant to always kind of be there you're always meant to be social as opposed to having a space that is for yourself that you can that would inevitably like in the past have been tied to tradition tied to you know your um ancestry tied to your um history and now it's just about you know continual immediate presence always being present in favor of perpetual communicative capacity and of course this dovetails with a number of the uh, other ideas pre pre presented in the text like the uh human as a you know political animal and an active animal and what that necessarily means i don't want to get into now but i think that you know this more or less covers what she means by the social and how she laments it and doesn't really appreciate this lack of distinction between private and public life and there are very good criticisms of her ideas as well she romanticizes the greeks in a concerning way um, she fails to recognize that the public and the private have always been connected like the very dynamics of private life mirror the dynamics of social life or, or public life i should say for example like the um you know heterosexual heterosexist patriarchal uh, dominion of men over women you know being a, uh, replicated in both spheres for example but yeah that i mean that just a brief look at the possible criticisms if i did anything wrong or you know i mischaracterized her i'd love to hear about it but click on one of these sides for one of the rent videos or episodes i've done and yeah catch you next time